Wait, where? What? Give me the box! Oh no. No, no! Not the box. This is the Escape the Zoo Podcast. <laughs> With your host, Daniel Clark. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Escape the Zoo Podcast, where we talk everything wildlife. Today's guest is Greg McCann, and Greg has a very interesting story. Basically, he has taken it upon himself to travel to some of the most remote wildernesses of Southeast Asia to find these isolated ecosystems where not only have very few people ever ventured to, but very small populations of highly, highly endangered species still exist. He then sets up remote camera traps in hopes of capturing proof of these animals' existence to help encourage support and funding from larger nonprofits and governments to help protect these areas. He has located critically endangered Sumatran tigers, found Asian elephants in an area where people hadn't seen proof of their existence in over 10 years, and is hoping to discover a previously unknown population of orangutans. Lastly, we even get into detailed stories that he's heard of sightings of a creature known as the Orang Pendek, which is essentially the Bigfoot of Southeast Asia. It's a really interesting conversation. I hope you enjoy it. So without further ado, here it is, my chat with the one and only Greg McCann. Well, Greg, thanks so much for taking the time to be on the podcast. I am really excited to get into this. Jeremy Hans, who has been on the podcast previously, spoke really highly of your work. And from what it it looks like online, you've been to some places, some jungles that (laughs) most people in the world have never dared venture or even knew existed. (laughs) Those are the ones I look for. I mean, I I try to go to the places where there's no other NGOs working or or, or places where they gave up a long time ago to see what's going on there. So I specifically seek those kind of places out you know i don't want to go to a place where there's other ngos working and there's going to be like issues competition you know a lot of them consider these parks their turf even though they're they're not or whatever and i just don't want to 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 deal with any of that so i just um look for other places and and they're there it's surprisingly even now in 2019 there are still some national parks in southeast asia which is the place with the the region with the world's highest deforestation rate. There are still some places where nobody goes, no tourists go there, there are no NGOs working, and, and nobody knows what kind of wildlife is in there. These some places like that still exist, and those are the places that draw me and fascinate me. What type of work primarily are you doing when you find these really remote places? Uh, we want to see what's in there. We want to try to you know, deter- determine the presence of certain species. You know, we're, of course, we're always shooting for like you know large carnivores, like you know tigers and stuff. You know, which have been extirpated through most of their historical range. So we're setting up camera traps. I'm you know, always happy with the clouded leopard, but always hoping to get tiger. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in Sumatra, we got a tiger in two weeks. Uh, wow. Yeah, we got, it's, in clouded leopard was one of the first. Um, animals we camera trapped in Cambodia, but that's now the largest carnivore there with tigers haven't been wiped out completely. Uh, you know, it's a sad situation. Cambodia is, is a, a, you know, difficult place to do conservation work. So is Sumatra. As I think I've chosen two of the, the toughest places on, on earth to do conservation work. <laughs> yeah. Well, Sumatra, I was reading an article that Jeremy wrote that talked about your trip to this kind of hidden forest that you referred to as the Noah's Ark of endangered uh-huh. slash potentially extinct species. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about where that place is, why it is kind of a Noah's Ark and hasn't been traveled yeah. to or visited as much? Yeah, sure. I mean, like, I mean, just up to like about a hundred years ago, almost all of Sumatra was covered in, in forests. I mean, yeah, yeah about 150 years ago, like the Dutch started clearing areas around what is now the, the capital of Maidan for tobacco uh, plantations. And, and then later came rubber and later came palm oil, you know. And so then finally, you know, these, these vast, vast lowlands. I mean, this Sumatra is like the size of California. So you can imagine 
if California was blanketed in lowland tropical rainforest, all of the animals that were in there basically were just obliterated and, and, and killed. And the only things that survived, all that survived was which were the animals that could flee into the mountains. Mm -hmm. And this um, particular place didn't even have a name. It, it was just this, this leftover land. And, and knowing that, you know, all these species once existed and in some pockets still exist in Sumatra, stuff like rhinoceros, tigers, orangutans, um, you know, that, that really drew me to it. In fact, I, I met this guy on Facebook. He's posting pictures. Some guy, I don't know how he got in touch with him, but some, some, a British guy named Phil Davis, who runs uh, some kind of, I forgot what, what, what his NGO is called. It's a tiger organization in India. He was the first foreigner to go visit this guy, Hare uh, Munth, which is, a, he's a Batak, a local Batak ethnic minority person in Sumatra, and he donated four camera traps to him. Mm -hmm. and, it, and with those four camera traps, he very quickly was getting tigers, um, uh, sun bears, golden cats, all kinds of great stuff. Oh, wow. And then he started posting that online. And then, but he wasn't, you know, wisely, I think, was not giving like the location of, of where he was. And then, you know, I was guessing where it was on Google Earth. And he's like, yeah, that, that's, that's where it is. <laughs> and, I, and I'm like, okay, I, I want to come. I, I want to come check it out. And then I, so I visited him four years in a row now, and I'm planning to go back there in April. And now uh, what we're going to do, this is huge mountain, is super steep, and I'm setting up some more cameras on the, tr the top of this mountain just to see what's up there. But um, what we heard just this past trip in, when I was there in uh, April of last year was a uh, helmeted hornbill. And you know, I don't know if you've ever heard of that species before, but it's you know, the most persecuted of all hornbill species, and they're, they're, it's the largest, the most, I think the most beautiful, and they're, they're you know, sought after by the Chinese for their red cask. They, have a, they, they consider it red ivory. And this is, it's never been, it's been witnessed, but never been filmed. Males will fly at each other and collide and hit their heads in midair to vie for dominance over the females in the area. Wow. They have this, they're, 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 they're massive. I think the wingspan's got to be like seven, eight feet or something like that. Oh, um, and they've got this amazing call. And we heard, we thought that they had been completely hunted out from the area because we were doing some, I was asking some questions about to villagers about them. They said 27 of them have been shot out in the past two years and they're gone now. And we were up on this plateau. To shot for, for fun? Is no, no they, they, they sell the heads to the Chinese. The Chinese pay about 200. They pay the, these guys about 200 bucks. And then they go and sell for thousands, um, you know, in, in Shanghai, Guangdong, Hong Kong. Yeah, helmeted hornbill. You, know, you can find a like, lot of Like they end up taxidermying the head? Is that what it is? Yeah, they, car they carve it. Like, like eyes really soft. Well, I don't know how soft, but it's like basically like, they consider it a red ivory and they, they make these, I guess, you know, beautiful looking Chinese carved. Oh, out of like the bill. Out of the whole head. It's not just the bill. It's the head and the bill. It's the only hornbill species where like the head and the bill are are this solid piece. Well, of course, it moves or whatever, you know, it's its mouth. But this, it's called a cask, C-A. Uh, S Q U E. Um, Interesting. It, it, I'll I'll cute. try and find some pictures and throw them in the show yeah, notes for people yeah. listening. Yeah, the helmeted hornbill. So anyway, we were up on this uh, plateau where we were checking our camera traps. Great because we had a tiger on the one camera just an hour before we arrived, and I was really hoping that we we would hear it roar in the night. We were camped up there. We didn't hear anything. Wow. But the next but the next morning we decided to do a to to hike to hike the circumference of the whole plateau, and it was getting like getting late and uh we got stung by bees and you know, bees there's a certain some type of bee that like hides under the leaves and they'll attack unprovoked i got stung on the eyelid my, my eyelids swelled up everyone got, everyone got stung you know it, it was getting kind of nasty and i'm thinking do we really really need to push on they're like, they're like let's just follow up to the end we're already up here i'm like all right and then we're standing up there and then there's just there's a, a view opens up and we're just admiring it and then we hear the call of the helmeted hornbill. It, it, it was, and I, I had heard the highlight of all my tra my nature travels before that was hearing a tiger roar in Thailand at, at night while we were camping. 
this beat even that. I mean, wow. I'll never, I'll never forget this. It, it starts off, it goes, <laughs> we're, we're staring at each like, no wow. way. Yeah, yeah. And then two of them started calling back and forth to each other. Then as we, as we continued hiking back out, we heard them again. So we know there's still some there, but unfortunately, I guess that they can be very easily fooled, even just with like a bottle cap or something. You can you can imitate their call, and they'll come in, and then they just they make these homemade guns using like a like a bicycle inner tube, which they'll just like wrap up over and over and over with, mm-hmm. like a, with a stick and a nail, and just like let go, and they can they shoot them. They're easy to trick, unfortunately, and um and and kill, and then they you know it's once they get them like a, a a call is put in very quickly to the middle middleman, and then they get they get in touch with the Chinese. The, the city of Maidan has a large Chinese population. They're basically the end consumers of all these helmeted hornbill heads, and you know whatever a rhinoceros horn if they could get it. Although this ecosystem no longer has rhinoceros, um, you know tiger parts, whatever. I mean, there's such a substantial Chinese population in Maidan city that. I don't think they even need to export. It can just be consumed locally there, which may, which makes it so much harder uh, to control. And so this was all taking place in this Noah's Ark of endangered yeah. species place. Yeah. And yeah. have is there a tough balance of do people know the location of this now? Do you want to almost keep that to yourself uh, so that like trying yeah. to encourage people to help support it while not tipping off people where these animals are. That must be a difficult. Yeah. It's difficult. You know what I mean? Like in the past, um, there were, there was a people hunted it out before the people, like what happened was some other national parks, um, the local hunters had hunted tigers down to such low numbers that they were either almost gone or it's too hard to find. So they start moving from other provinces to this area and then i guess in the 1990s there was like a pretty large tiger hunting campaign poaching campaign in this place so tigers had already been reduced to very low numbers mm-hmm. and, then they, and then they just kind of gave up and left so they know that they're that they were there and the, and all the, when you when you walk around these villages Everyone tells you stories about tigers. But there's footprints, scratch marks, people encounter them on the roads. Mm-hmm. Everyone knows they're there. It's just a matter of is, is someone going to call the Chinese middleman, the middleman to see if someone wants to place an order. And, and that's the thing you know, that, that we worry about. Um, but, you know, we, 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 we take the camera trap pictures. We had a meeting with the government and we're trying to get it. Like turned in, it, it has no status at all. The place is, is nothing. It's just like I said, like a leftover land. We're trying to get it upgraded into some kind of like wildlife sanctuary. I don't even know if that would really help. Like, and I think it feels like in Indonesia or just about anywhere in Southeast Asia, a national park or a wildlife sanctuary is really just a paper park. You know, it, it a park is protected not in name only uh, on paper only not that in reality so is the goal of your work to go find these places where these animals are still existing and essentially use the camera traps to coerce large ngos and nonprofits in to to come in and help to buy yeah. up that land and support and protect that land is yeah. that your ultimate goal yeah yeah we and we almost had it we 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 almost had it um with um I don't want to name the the, the donor, but um, because we may in the future you know, we'll reapply with them. But we were this close to it, and the, the ridiculous reason we got for our rejection was that um, so we want government data on the species that are there, not just your data. We're like, well, there is no government data on it. It's all the data is from us, is and and that guy and it, everyone else was in. It, it, the, the signals we got were you're going to be approved for this, and then this guy um, stubbornly said no, and then he quit m- a month later. He's not even with the organization anymore. So, so uh, basically, they would come in and they're like, okay, we've seen on the camera trap that there are tigers here. Yeah, there are. What other species are you looking? So the hornbills, the helmeted hornbills, monk up, up. jack, right? Monk jack, right? Yeah, there. yeah. It, so, so far, we've got tiger, clouded leopard, golden cat, leopard cat, marble cat. We've got five species of cats. 
there. I mean, what Damn. else do you want? Yeah, and, yeah, and I mean, how <laughs> big how big is this area that we're talking about? Is it a large expanse or is it a pretty like pocketed niche ecosystem? I mean, it's 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 isolated, but it's still fairly large. It's big enough, and um, there, there could be um, another kind of cat there called the flat-headed cat. That's what, and I, we set some cameras up down by the rivers to try to see, to find that. That would be really special. There's only been like one or two records of flat-headed cat in, in Sumatra, so if we could possibly get a six cat there. Um, I'm, you know, in one of those Guardian articles, you know, we brought in an orangutan expert, but we didn't have enough time to do it right. Um, you know, you really need, because, you know, theoretically there could be orangutans there, although there would be at a low population because we did a lot of um, like kind of informal interviews with, with villagers, and most of them said that before people started, before a lot of people started moving to the area and chopping trees down, they were here but at low numbers, and then they just got hunted out and they're gone now. Although a few said there's, there, there's still a couple hanging on in there or whatever. You know, um, but whether whether or not we ever have a, a, an orangutan-specific search, I, I can't say because funding is so so bad right now, so mm-hmm. low uh, that uh, I, I don't know what what the future is for that. Yeah, well, I think that was the, in the article, they mentioned that that was one of the goals was to find this isolated orangutan species yeah. or population that may or may not currently exist. But one of the difficulties, right, is that they don't come down to the ground particularly frequently. So to get a camera trap up in the trees where they're hanging out and actually have a clear visible shot is yeah. near impossible. Yeah, and, and the thing is, I guess in Borneo they do come to the ground, but they they don't come to the ground in Sumatra because of the tiger threat, and mm. and, and apparently some people have witnessed tigers and orangutans fighting and rolling around on the ground what? together. I can't imagine these two giant fur balls going at it. I mean, an orangutan is seven times as strong as a man, they say. But then Yikes. again, I mean. But then again, I mean, uh, you know, a, a tiger, you know, I don't even know how, how, to, how you compare it to the strength of a man. Yeah, it'd be like one big orange commotion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about, uh, I also read that there's some almost uh, Yeti-like creatures there that yeah. people don't know if they're actually species yeah. or not, like the orang yeah. pen deck, which is, yes. can you describe what yeah, folks yeah, think yeah. that is? And do you believe that that exists? Uh, yeah. This is what I like this to say about it. I, I like the the possibility that it could exist. I mean, well, what I mean by that is that there's enough unexplored habitat that no one really knows what's out there, and just just if if, if we can even imagine that it exists, that means that there's enough forests and mountains that are unexplored that our curiosity can can go there. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not something you, you can just write off. I know a guy uh, um, named Jeremy Holden. He's been working in Karinj. In fact, I just met with him last week in Phnom Penh, where he's based. He's been working in um, uh, Karinchi National Park, in which that which is also in Sumatra. That, that national park is four times the size of Bali Island, and um, that's that's the the main place where, over the years, dating back something like three or four hundred years to, to Dutch rule. Even the Dutch were seeing the Aran Pendak. It was described by them back then. And Jeremy says he saw it twice. And he told me um, a story recently about, you know, supposedly it has a strange footprint, with like almost like a backward pointing. Can you describe for listeners real quick what people think it is or what it looks like? I, I, I guess it would be like a blonde-haired orangutan. Okay. <laughs> I guess it, it but it like walks that. on two feet, right, apparently? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, anyway, he says, um, you know, it's like a tropical Yeti is what it is. Anyway, he said um, he had seen it twice. And then wait, there was... Wait, does uh, he uh, seem like a credible guy or is this... Yeah, like, totally, yeah. totally. Yeah, I, mean, I, mean, like, <laughs> I wasn't you know, sure if this is some guy who's living up in the jungle by no, himself. No, 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 he is. I mean, he's, a, he's um, you know, not just a photographer, but um, like, yeah, I mean, a, a scientist and conservationist in his own right. I and mean, he's published dozens of scientific oh, cool. papers about all kinds of animals and stuff. And, and he, I think if I remember correctly, he told me one time that he wished he'd never saw it because he wouldn't have wasted 10, 20 years of his life trying to camera trap it there. <laughs> and it, he really wishes he hadn't seen it because then he ended up, you know, I mean, you, 
you know, spending so much time and effort. Um, but anyway, he said at this in this new story that I hadn't heard before. He said that a report came in that there were footprints of this thing uh, in this one area. So he and this other woman and this local Indonesian tracker, like one of the best trackers, decide to go in and investigate. And they find the footprints. And so they're walking around up there for a while. And it's an area not where not many people go to. And this is suddenly the, the Langer monkeys just start going nuts. And not, not be, they're going nuts not because of, because of humans, but for some other reason. So they're panicking and screaming in a way you never hear. And they're like, it may be that that might be it. That's it. Okay, let, let's strategize here. I'm going to stand here. And the other woman, you stand here. And the tracker, you go up and see if you can flush it down. And one of us will try to get a picture of it. Tracker says he goes up and he sees it. And the thing turns on him with this menacing look. And, he, and the tracker just runs back down towards them. And, and runs down towards my friend, scared for his life. Mm -hmm. Runs, run, runs towards my friend Jeremy, and the the orang pendek came down to Debbie, and Jeremy turned to her as it passed. He said she crumpled up into like a ball and fell to the ground when she saw it because she, she was just so horrified and, and blown away by it. He said the tracker had so lost his cool that even though they had bottles of water there, he, his hand was shaking. He tore a leaf off of a tree and turned the leaf into a funnel and started scooping water out of a river and drinking out of it because he was like partially delirious about. Oh my God, how big do they think? How tall? <laughs> Sounds uh, like a scary creature. No, nah, nah, I think they're only supposed to be about five feet tall, five foot two or something like that. But, you know, um, it, it, yeah, so like, do you believe it? I'll say this. I mean, like, generally, I'm I'm skeptical. But to hear Jeremy talk about it, it, it it's hard not. I I I don't I don't doubt what he says. Yeah, so I believe what he says. I don't know what kind of answer that is for you. No, I mean, <laughs> I I think I tend to question it too. You know, you're like maybe this guy's just smoking something up in the jungle no, and it's no, saying no, things. Not. But but uh, I don't know if he's. I'm sure he's an incredible guy. It sounds, if anything, it's lifted my uh, curiosity where now I want to go try and see if I can be the one to discover it, you know? Yeah, but, you know, when I talk to the guys uh, in in our forest, uh, in the forest where, where, we, where we work, um, they there seems to be some confusion in, you know, about, depending on what region you're in, the name of this thing changes. In the area where he is, that's called the Orang Pendak. But there's also like a general name for some kind of forest spirit called the Orang Bunyan. It can be heard but not seen. And that's supposed to be like not an empirical being but like a spirit. But like the Orang Pendak is an empirical being, a species, you know, some, you know, long forgotten, you know, you know, hominid or something. I don't know. But um, they tell me that there's something, a monster called the Orang Bunyan, which they credit for some of these mountains still having forest on them. They say that the villagers won't go up there because the Orang Bunyan is up there and it has magic. And it can, they say that like if you and your friends go hiking up in the mountains and you're talking, it will, it will listen and learn your voice. And then if one of you stops to take a leak, he will imitate your friend and, and call you over. And if you go to it, you will become one of them. <laughs> and wow. You will, and you will never be seen or heard from again. It kind of reminds me of, uh, you ever watched the show Lost on, I think it was ABC? They had this, no. the smoke monster. And <laughs> all the people <laughs> just kept seeing this smoke monster on this island that their plane crash landed on and that was the last of them anytime they saw the smoke monster <laughs> no and then um up in up in uh Aceh in gunung loser national park it goes by the name of sukumante so it's got there's there's kind of like some confusion among the locals about is this all the same creature is it a spirit is it real or, or, or what like you, you're, you can't really get a clear answer from people. Anyway, it's been written about 
as far as the very beginning of Dutch occupation 350 years ago. Damn. Yeah. So I want to, I'm going to link to some photos of what the Orang Pendek could look like, but I want, yeah. I don't want to, I could, I could talk about this for hours and I don't want to dive too down this path because I want to yeah. focus on the, the animals that we know you've captured on, on yeah. camera traps and understand why these areas aren't being protected as they should be. I mean, the Sumatran tiger itself, that is the most critically endangered of all yeah. tiger species. Is that true? How many uh, do they think there are currently? You know, they always bat around this number of like 400, 450. I, you know, but that, that doesn't include like where our project area, which we, which we think has about 20. I, I, I bet there's uh, about five, 600, in, you know, in, in total throughout the island. But, you know, it's, you know, I own the size of California, so five or six hundred, and you got people out there hunting them as well. Mm -hmm. if, they, if they found some Vietnamese hunting gang in, in, in Loser National Park, I mean, they, finally, they were, fortunately, they were arrested, but they were in there after tigers. I mean, these guys will come and, like, camp out in the jungle for six months to find a tiger. I mean, hardcore uh, poachers, I mean, it's just uh, off the charts. I mean, just... It, hard to imagine how these species hang on. So what's the, the dream? You go in there, you document these camera traps, you, you get somebody to protect them. What was that NGO that ended up backing out? What was their plan to, to go in, buy up the land and actually put in protective services? Well, the, yeah, that, that NGO does buy up land, but I, I don't know if, if how much of that land was for sale. But like what they what we do is like try to like get the community involved in in conservation. Like actually, like a lot of the people out there who live on the fringes, like the the the, the ecosystem is surrounded by vast palm oil plantations, mm -hmm. and most people have just about no regular work outside of the palm oil plantations, which is hard and doesn't pay well. And, um, you know, th these, these tigers, um, are, are still breeding actually in this area. And then, but you know, tigers, there can only be so many tigers within a certain radius. And once, and the young will start to spread out to try to find their new area. Mm -hmm. And when they, and when they do, they find themselves in palm oil plantations. And when they go out there, um, they end up stepping in snare traps, which were set for, not for tigers, but for deer or pig. And so tigers are, can be, you know, like a bycatch or whatever, you know, from these snare traps. Mm -hmm. So they're just, there's just nowhere for them to go. They, they, they can breed and the babies are not able to establish a new range. And um, so what we were going to do then with the help of the, the NGO and the funding is to try to st get rid of these snares and maybe try to set up corridors because along some of the some of the rivers that come out of this ecosystem, there are other mountainous areas, and we could theoretically, you know, let tigers establish new ranges, and in, in even using parts of the palm oil plantation. I mean, it would be really a tricky job, mm -hmm. but no other option, you know. It, and and this, you know, when you see the camera trap pictures, it, you know, you you'll want to fight for it you know, when when you know that they're still there and um. With the amount of money that they were going to give, which was substantial, uh, it could it was totally possible. We could could have done it. What has brought you into this line of conservation work? I kind of get the sense that you're almost like a rogue guy <laughs> going out and doing these. And in, in, no, in 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 the greatest sense, like they always say, uh, somebody else is going to take care of it, right? And sometimes <laughs> that doesn't happen. I feel like you've taken it upon yourself to, as an individual, go out and really try and capture the data that large NGOs need to protect places of the world that very few know about. Um, okay. How did you even begin to start this process? Uh, you know, I think as, as a kid, I was always really into nature. I mean, just it, I, mean, I live in the, the suburbs of Buffalo, New York, and we're very fortunate to have this, this creek, and they would call it a river in Asia, but it's a, a creek here, and it's got, there's even fossils in it, there's a small, it's a canyon in sections, and as a, as a kid, I would just spend, you know, my friends and I would just spend days and days, you know, all day long just playing in there, and I think a sense of adventure grew from there, and then I went to college in, in New York City, and um, what, then I, after, New York, after college, I went to Taiwan, where I lived for 12 years uh, as a teaching English, and, um, and I started to get in back into 
uh, exploring nature when I was in Taiwan. And in Taiwan, there's you know, it's tropical forests, similar, very similar to Sumatra and, and Cambodia, where we have our projects. And then I started learning about some of the species that, that lived in Taiwan. Taiwan used to have a clouded leopard, but they were hunted out during the Japanese occupation. And that kind of fascinated me that there, there was a large predator, a leopard, that lived on the small island of Taiwan. And, and then from there, I started t- like taking trips to Thailand and Cambodia. And then, and, and then I, I always liked national parks more than the cities. And then, mm-hmm. and then just my curiosity just started building. Like, it looks okay. So then, what what animals live in here? And then you see like a list of the animals that live in there. I started learning about like the different type of, of primates, like gibbons. You know, what is that thing that I hear singing? That's not a bird. That's an, that's an ape. That's the smallest of all apes. Those are gibbons. And like, learning about all this, and then I just became my my fascination just grew grew back completely. I think from the time of you know when I was a kid. So I kind of came full circle, found myself again. And how did you end up ultimately finding this Noah's Ark in Sumatra where you, you were going through the jungles and started to, is it through indigenous cultures? Is it through other conservationists? Uh, no, so like the, the, the first kind of real wildlife survey project we had was in Cambodia. That, and that grew out of a, a PhD doctoral research, which was on animism in this outside this national park. And, and the spirit mountains inside of the national park. animism being uh, yeah it's, a, it's just a, like a generic term for like the the worship the, of animals uh, or just a generic term for like the 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 original religion of indigenous people all over the world that that like you know rocks trees rivers Got waterfalls it. are are all in, inhabited by spirits um, and and I the reason I chose Cambodia was that. That's one of the only places where there, there's pure animism in large parts of the country, largely because of the very tragic, you know, the, the Khmer Rouge uh, genocide, which took place, the Civil War, followed by the Vietnamese occupation. And because of that, like religious missionaries just stayed out. They were not allowed in there. And, um, and so I wanted to go up and see... What 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 is it like to be around people who still really believe in you know tree fairies and all this stuff and then mm-hmm. that was which was just wonderful and and then yeah I mean you know we, we we were hoping that there was still some rhinoceros and tigers in in uh in that park in Cambodia but there's not they've been eradicated uh, throughout the whole country and we checked carefully and then so I wanted to go to a place where I thought. There might. I mean, I, then actually, I, I we well, we heard the tiger roar in Thailand because before I started, first I was doing doctoral research. It was like anthro, more like anthropological research on the in, indigenous people, and then I, my interest evolved into conservation of this national park. And um, this guy from this great NGO called Freeland, this guy Tim Redford, contacted me, and he said. Um, Greg, uh, we were talking, I told him I want to set up some camera traps, I'm going to do a little fundraising, we want to see if there's still some tigers in there. He's like, um, you know, you, all right, you can't just go setting up cameras willy-nilly, you know, there's kind of a way to do it. Why don't you come out and join us for one of our camera checks in Thailand, flew out to Bangkok, and, um, you know, living in Taiwan, that's easy, that was a three-hour flight, and I, I love Thailand anyway. So we, I went in there, and um, the first night, we heard it. It was crazy. And he said in his 20 years, Tim said in his 20 years of conservation in Southeast Asia, he had never heard a tiger roar before. We heard it. Ow. Ow. And it, it, it circled the, the wow. camp. Yeah. It, it did it like for like 20 seconds in four directions ar- around the camp. And then Wild. we found his, Yeah. We found his footprints in the morning and um, his camera trap pictures of me. And then, and then exactly like two hours later, the tiger in the, on the same camera trap. They say it was, could have been watching us, following us. Or That's whatever. crazy. If it was roaring around the camp, do you think it was in response to you guys being there? You know, there could be a variety of reasons. You know, it could be like a love call to mates. You know, it could have been something territorial. could have been a warning. Could have, I mean, the thing is that it's amazing to me that the tiger poaching is not as big of a problem in that area as it is because – that part, that area is not so far from Cambodia, and that's that area has 
the last stand of Siamese rosewood, the last substantial stand of Siamese rosewood, which is a really valuable tree. They call it the, the, the red blood of the forest. And so literally thousands of Cambodians cross illegally into the border over the border of Thailand and go chopping these trees down. And if we're hearing the tigers roar, and you can see their footprints all over the place and, and scratch marks in the trees. So if we're seeing this, so are they. And they gotta be thinking, but I guess they're going after the trees first. We've got camera trap pictures of them with guns and all there's been shootouts. So we almost couldn't go into the park because there was like a shootout between Cambodian Rangers and National and, uh, and Cam- that, between, I'm sorry, between Thai Rangers and the Cambodian poachers. Um, I, I don't know if it's a rumor or what, but they, they, I, I guess they try to prove a point to the Cambodians, and they, they, they wrapped one guy in like eight bicycle tires and poured gasoline on him, lit him on fire, and kicked him down a mountain and made the others watch him burn to death going down and say, this is what happens to your friends if you want to come back into this place. Wait, who <laughs> the, did that? Thai, the Thai? The, 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 the Thais as what I heard, they, they did this to the Cambodian logger and um, since, because nothing else is working. They say that there are lit jails filled with thousands of Cambodian loggers and they don't even know what to do with them. Finally, they leave them in there for a few months and then send them home. And I've heard that the, the Cambodians still lay landmines near on the Thai-Cambodia border to intimidate the Thai police or the Thai military so that the Thais won't chase them too far over the border because the Cambodians know where the landmines are and the Thais don't. This is how serious it is. This is like militarized, yeah. really, really rough stuff like, like happening out, out there. Yeah, that's and, dark. Yeah. <laughs> dark story. Right, sorry. Yeah. Is... Wait, what is your having such a but, but, local... by, but, but, but by the way th- that story i told you came out of the newspaper that was not a story told to me by any anyone who i've named in this uh video that 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 story about the ty- the bicycle tires and the gasoline was actually in in the press in, yeah either in the the bangkok post or the um or the 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 nation those are the, the two thai newspapers that's where i got that one from do you feel any sense of fear going into those places that you might come upon some of these poachers or loggers and there could be conflict from that? Yeah, I started to uh, in Cambodia because we got camera trap pictures of, of uh, Vietnamese with, you know, with weapons and stuff. Uh, a whole team of seven of them with guns. I, mean, I don't know what they're after. They were, we rediscovered elephants in the park in our camera chat. It's one of our great successes in Cambodia as we found elephants and they hadn't been i read that like you found them for the first time in like 10 they hadn't been yeah. recorded in like 10 years or something yeah crazy like yeah that. yeah so i don't know if, if that's what they're after or what but there's a herd of like 13 or 14 of them and um you know i can't imagine what else they're going after and why they're so well armed um because the the valuable logs they're looking for the siamese rosewood once could be found throughout laos vietnam Cambodia and Thailand, and now it's it's reduced to this pocket of national parks in in Thailand. Um, so, what? That, I, that actually made me think maybe there's tigers still there if they're coming in with guns. Otherwise, they're say, after this herd. But the, you know, elephants, Asian elephants, don't have big tusks, mm-hmm. and, and only the males would, I think. And so, I, I I don't know. I don't know. Uh, um, I asked the the guys. They say they're they're going after anything and everything. Like there's some some type of tree which, um, when they find it, they cut it down and like the in when the inside of the tree starts to rot, I forget the name of the tree. It, it crystallizes and that can be used for the drug ecstasy. It makes is used for MDMA and it's extremely valuable. So like what they'll do is they'll come into the park and just look for anything and then they look for the trees. They'll set snares for animals, um, you know, just whatever. You know, they, they, they'll just go in there and and try to find whatever they can. And 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 there's no one to oppose them. So, anyway, so I, finally, after all that in Cambodia, I wanted to go to a place where there were actually still some tigers. Where I, and I met the guy Hare on Facebook, 
And um, he invited me to come down and set up cameras in Sumatra, and we found them there. I could have and probably should have uh, had a project in Thailand. There's still a couple areas where nobody is working, um, and they wanted me to to do it, to, to set up a program there. The problem was I didn't have stable funding, and I was afraid mm-hmm. that. You know, like the, in, in, in Cambodia, if I can't come up with the, with the money for a camera check, we try to check the cameras like every three or four months. Like if I can't do it, it's just okay. Sorry, we'll wait another four months and it'll be eight months instead of four. And they're totally cool with that. And, and the situation I'm in now, I kind of need that flexibility. And I was afraid that in, in Thailand, um, you know, if, if I wasn't able to come up with the money, you know, it would be unprofessional or they would be, you know, upset about it or something. So mm-hmm. I, I didn't want to commit myself to something which I, I didn't think I could really uh, commit to. I needed the, um, yeah, the, the flexibility of Cambodia. But, but what's that What's that feeling like opening up a camera trap and not knowing what's in there? Oh, uh, so there, especially if it's been eight months. It's the most exciting thing. It's so fun. It really is. Uh, it, it hard to describe. Really, really hard to describe. It's um, you know, kind of almost like a, a group of kids, you know, looking at a the porno <laughs> mag for the first time or, <laughs> or something. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's it's wonderful. Is there one photo in particular that stands out as I can't believe I just found this on a camera trap? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I've got this fabulous photo of a tiger. In um, in um, in Sumatra, but I also got a, one of the one one of the few and the best videos. I have one one camera set to video on a fallen log on the ground, and I, of a gibbon on the on the ground, and he he turns, he, he comes down, and he looks at the camera and he has this horrified look on his face, <laughs> and then it, it, he he moves like about six feet away and looks back at his mouth. Hangs open again, horrified, and runs farther away. That's probably one of the best captures I've ever Whoa. had. What do you think he was looking at? Uh, he, he he saw it. He saw the camera lens, and he just he oh, just, it was just the flash. He, you know, it, it, he it makes some tiny sound, and their ears can hear anything. So they he heard it, and he was just terrified. And then he realized that it was benign or whatever, and didn't um, and and, and hung out for a little while after that. But that. That capture is probably the best, but like my first tiger picture, my first clouded leopard picture, and that that given on the ground, those three, I would say. You mentioned funding being a consistent thing yeah. that that is a struggle to go after. Where is the main sources of funding coming from, and how could listeners support if they wanted to help fund and continue the work? Um, yeah, I mean, you know. Um, it, it, it's a, it's a tough question because the, the the group which we had going, which was originally called Habitat ID, we may be dismantling it because we never became a 501c3 entity. We're just a New York State registered entity, but not a federal 501c3 mm-hmm. nonprofit group. Because so much time has elapsed, and the my fellow board members are, have kind of lost interest in it. I don't think it's a good place to donate to anymore. The website may actually shut down. So it, there's actually nothing besides my, my PayPal account right now. That is all there is and, and nothing else. Um, and But we're trying to change that. You know, me and the, this new team who join me in Cambodia are, might start a brand new um, uh 501 and make it immediately a 501c3 organization to start a new NGO. And, and as Tim was telling me from in Thailand, there's always room for new NGO. Mm-hmm. Like, um, he said people get what's called donor fatigue. You know, they get, they get tired of donating to the same pe- place over and over again. Like, you know, if it was WWF or whatever, they just, they can grow tired of this. And so if you're out there, you're doing something new, you can get funding. So, that so that the future probably why not uh join like a larger nonprofit and and do work with them is there because i look at somebody like yourself who has an incredible amount of credibility amongst people who i really trust and even looking online the amount of incredibly rare creatures that you've camera trapped is unbelievable and it sounds like to me that you have this consistent 
funding problem that's really stopping you from doing what you want to be doing you know what i mean it's like i'm i'm yeah. sure you like being out in the jungle setting traps yeah. a lot more than you like fundraising and setting up ngos yeah. yeah yeah um is there why not join like a wwf or uh something like that who would help to support the work yeah another excellent question and and, and i am actually um it, i'm helping out with this group called prcf foundations was that people resources community and forest the, so it's like prcf.org mm -hmm. and, and it's run by this guy named fernando potes and he's he's uh, an organizer and it's his ngo and he's based in thailand and he has projects he's the guy who, who i was working on with the grant for um the, the, which kind of fell through and um we uh we i think we actually have now got a little bit of money to do gibbon research and oh cool and, yeah, in Sumatra and, and, and something else and maybe another one. But what, there's like several stages of like these applications and we're now getting into the advanced stages and I, sh you know, hopefully should be getting paid, you know, some kind of consulting fee for when I go to Sumatra in, in April. And um, that'll be the first time ever if that actually happens. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, cause otherwise, I mean, it's, it's hard to to maintain, you know, just out of pocket. Yeah. I mean, it's, you would like to think that a lot of the larger NGOs that receive the bulk of the funding for wildlife related things are, are looking for people boots on the ground who really have that know-how and that knowledge and that expertise who don't necessarily want to be investing the time to be fundraising and, yeah, and putting right. up an, an NGO, like somebody like myself, who is, uh, worked in the nonprofit space and understands like the grant writing process and how time consuming that is to, to yeah. as one person to not only be writing the grant, setting up, doing all the bookkeeping, plus actually traveling for yeah. substantial periods of time to do things. It's just a lot for one person to take on. Yes. And I look yeah. at yourself and I'm like, I need more of Greg's work <laughs> to be helping out and informing people. I mean, I look at play, the place like um, Noah's Ark in Sumatra yeah. and who knows how long that a place like that is going to exist. And yeah, yeah, yeah. They're building a dam. The, the Koreans want to build a dam in there. That, that's going to mess things up. You know, uh, there, there'll still be a lot of the park, which would be, well, not a park, a, a lot of the ecosystem will still be okay after the dam, but the dam is certainly going to mess things up and, and destroy a beautiful waterfall. And um, uh, it's it's unnecessary. It's unneeded. You know, it's just Indonesia is one of the most corrupt countries in the world. You know, the, you know, it's all bribes and kickbacks and you know, projects which are unneeded will, will move forward because you know, some cement company is in league with you know some you know politician who you know the palms get greased and these 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 projects get green lighted and they never should. Yeah, I was talking to Jeremy about it. A little bit when he was on the podcast because we spent a lot of time talking about the Sumatran rhino. Yeah, and it's such a really interesting concept when you have like we're all humans living on this world, and there's these other beautiful species that we inhabit it with. And for strange borderlines that were created centuries ago, yeah, that that specific species just happens to fall within the government, and really, it's just a few people in the um in indonesia that have the power to control the fate and destiny of an entire species of animals and that's not even necessarily saying that they have malintent around it but more just the fact that that's even plausible even if they were trying to protect them to the fullest extent it's just a weird concept it is really <laughs> you weird. know what i mean because uh, we were talking about there's such a small population of those sumatran rhinos that realistically for them to breed to a sizable formidable population in the wild is almost impossible but the ability for them to relocate those rhinos and try and get them into a breeding facility has proven to be really difficult as well and they lost a rhino that was um that died yeah. during one of those seizure attempts yeah and so you're in this weird spot where you're like do we try and capture the rhinos and bring them to a breeding facility and then reintroduce them or do we let them just kind of go off into extinction or is there a population we don't know about? And ultimately it really comes down to like a handful of people who are determining yeah. the fate of one of the biggest megafauna yeah, ever to exist in the world. And it's a really strange concept. 
and they're, they're such like a shy and wonderful like little like creature. I mean, like you know, I guess they almost like chirp like birds or something. And they they sing to each other. And yeah, it's yeah, crazy. yeah. They sing. I mean, um, you know, there, there's one success story in Indonesia that that's Ujung Kulong National Park, where the Javan rhinos population has actually expanded. That's the southwestern tip. Um, you know, there's one of my friends is like, you know, they should make down and Jeremy's been in this place way down in um in South Sumatra. There's a place called Way Canvas National Park, and they have like this little Sumatran rhino um, center there where I think he actually saw them and, and took pictures of them. Mm-hmm. And, and, and my friend said, why, why not, you know, just try to gather the, the, the Sumatran rhinos that are that there are still in the wild in some of these other places in Sumatra and bring them down to Way Canvas and just make Way Canvas another Ujong Kulong National Park. It's a, a well protected, not, you know, Ujong Kulong is not losing any rhinos to poachers. Let's make this the one of Sumatra and then they don't go extinct. Um, but again, you know, the, the whole capturing process is going to be risky. Most mm-hmm. likely, you know, some are going to be lost during that. Um, and then, you know, who's going to pay for it? Is there the, the political will to do it? And you're going to get scientists and, and academics disagreeing about it. And, you know, it, 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 I've heard Indonesia described as an ungovernable country. And, and I think it, it may actually kind of be, you know, I mean, it, it wasn't, I don't think it was even really a country as it is now with all these thousands of islands, you know, until like the 1950s or 60s mm-hmm. or something like that. I mean, how do you, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm sometimes too pessimistic. My, my thoughts is just, are just see it while you can. Try to see it while you can because, um, you know, I, I, it's hard. Southeast Asia is, just a, is a tough place to be optimistic about. Yeah, well, that uh, kind of answered what my next question was going to be in terms of like what your outlook is in general. Is there any hope? Like, what what is your what is there to be hopeful about? Uh, um, no, I, I I can't say I'm too hopeful. I mean, you know, the the last great hope I was thinking was Thailand. Like, they they seem to have it like less snaring problem. But I don't know if you saw in the news recently, Vietnamese gangs now caught on camera in Thailand, not only snaring and killing a tiger, but like taking pictures of themselves beating the the tiger on the head while it's just about dead to show how how tough they are or whatever um it, it it's hard for me to i, I mean real realistically uh, no not not really I, i'm not i'm I, I i'm not very optimistic but you know luck can always play a role and when you hear that tiger roar in the forest like i did when you hear the the helmet hornbill it does seem like there's a chance, like there's a slight chance. You, you mm-hmm. never really know, you know, economies can collapse, projects can fail, revolutions can happen, volcanoes can erupt, you know, who, 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 something can happen. And, and there could still be this a little pocket left and they can expand. Who knows? But, you know, the track record is not good at all. Yeah, well, I think... What I really respect and appreciate about your work is that despite being stacked up against all odds and despite really finding funding wherever you can to be able to do this, ultimately it's going to come down to folks like yourself who can even locate where these animals exist in the first place. I mean, you're finding places and setting up camera traps to prove, show people that these animals do exist what yeah. they look like. I mean, I even was looking at some of your photos. I've like, I've never even heard of a golden cat or I didn't, oh. uh, I mean, looking at the Asiatic bears, the sun yeah. bears, yeah. there's so much stuff that you've captured that I think as much as when you're on the ground, you can have this pessimistic outlook because you see all the horrible things that are being done. There's also the other side of it where I'm just optimistic to even imagine that there are these pockets, niche little ecosystems where these animals still exist. And in an incredible way without much support from like large NGOs or anything like that, you've really taken it upon yourself to go out and prove this to people. And hopefully people will listen and uh, hopefully somebody won't back out last second, like the last guy and we can start (laughs) protecting some of these places, you know? Yeah. You know what? One of the things that keeps me going is over the years is just, is my, uh, this revolving group of 
friends and like trekking partners, like people who contact me, hey, I heard you go out to Cambodia, I heard you go into Sumatra, you're doing this, here are my interests, this is my background, I'd really like to join you. Um, you know, can I can I do it? And sometimes these messages come in at a time where I'm feeling kind of despondent about it. Like, you know, do I really need uh, to push on with this? And, they, and I get these friends who are now they're long. I think they're good friends now who keep pushing. You know, inspire me to to go on and stuff like this. And I think even this podcast, you know, helps you know, give me some inspiration to to continue. Hell yeah. Well, I really appreciate that. And I'm super thankful of you taking the time. For listeners who do want to support areas like Southeast Asia, can you just throw out a handful of of nonprofit groups that you yeah. do feel like folks should be supporting? Sure. There's, uh, the, in, in, there's a group, a great group in Thailand. And I really think Thailand needs to, the, the support because this they've still got... The, animals left to protect uh they're called freeland okay it's just it's just freeland.org they're really good and um in cambodia is wildlife alliance so in, so those are those are, are two great ones there's also um a one in, in vietnam called duke langer.org um they uh let me see if i can type it up here for you um well, I'll put it, I'll, I'll find it. I'll throw it all in the show okay, notes for yeah. people. So for, for folks listening who do want to check out the work of these organizations, you can look in the blog post in the show notes for the podcast episode and, and all the links will be there. It, yeah. And, and of course, the one who I'm working with now, PRCF Foundation. Yeah, so the, these, and, and uh, you know, they're not as famous as like WWF or Panthera or, or Wildlife mm-hmm. Conservation Society, but they do amazing work. And, and they really could use support. And my last question is, mm-hmm. if you were to take a billboard, put it on the side of a major highway, that could disseminate one message in 10 words or less, what would that be? Oh, <laughs> that's a tough question. I saved, I, I saved the hard one for last. Um, it would be so, something about curiosity, like, you know, you know, uh, do we have a cure? Is do we are we suffering from a a lack of curiosity crisis? And then a, a picture of like a clouded leopard, a Sumatran orangutan, and a golden cat or something. You know, and hopefully inspire people. You know, what is that thing? Where does it live? I want to know about that. We I, I hope that people could be curious about these things. Yeah. I hope we're not hope we're not lacking. Well, a, a curiosity crisis. Well, there's always that saying, "Curiosity killed the cat." I think in <laughs> your in your your travels, it's almost curiosity has found the cats. You know what I mean? <laughs> so hopefully that inspires people. I'm going to link to a bunch of your work and a bunch of your photos and a bunch of Thank these you. species that you found that I had never even heard of uh, in the show notes, so people can check them out. I'm also going to pay hard attention to if we can find the rang pendek and if that is the true yeah, yeah, bigfoot yeah, yeah, yeah. of the of southeast asia because that would yeah. be amazing yeah. um but thank you so much for all that you do i think uh there's always the saying if 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 not me then who and i think you embody that more than anybody else uh really taking a stab at trying to make a difference in conservation so thank you for that and thank you for everybody listening and until next time stay wild Thank you so much for listening. I honestly cannot express how much I appreciate you taking the time. For all information regarding this episode's guest, social channels, books, how you can support, etc., please check out our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please, please, please subscribe to the podcast. We are everywhere that you can find podcasts. Subscribe to Escape the Zoo on YouTube, follow Escape the Zoo on Instagram, like Escape the Zoo on Facebook, and please share with your friends. It honestly goes so far and means so much to me. And lastly, if you'd like to be emailed with each new podcast and any other major Escape the Zoo updates, visit escapethezoo.tv and sign up for our email list. Thank you.